had a talk with our hosts where we're staying at this bed and breakfast, and uh, their background is um, Calvinism and the Reformed Church. And so sharing with them things that are in the Paleolithic Hebrew and the picture stories and just making sense of like some fundamental Christian things that was a big dispelling of some of their wrong ideas. Like, we're, like, like for example, the concept of Basar and the idea that Christ is the only begotten, the elect one, the chosen one, and the idea of how the inheritance works. And it goes to that one. And if you're in that one, you are the beneficiary of that. So it's not that God chooses different people. He doesn't elect certain people. There is one that's elect. And if you're under him, his tent. So I was getting to the idea of the word for a father being a tent pole and under his tent canopy. You'll buy in the, in the word for mother is men. And it's this waters and how the woman, the mother binds everything together. And she's pervasive as water and all this kind of stuff inside the home and binds everyone together. And they're like, wow, this is really fascinating. So <clears throat> getting into the idea of what is an elect chosen one, it's basar, bacher, and it could be where we get the English word bizarre from, where all those things are pulled together into one, and you, you are benefited by that, you know, and that thing. So if you're in Christ, you are elect chosen because you are seen with that, as that person, as that name, they're your representative, they're your head, and they said, well, this is all making sense. And so we're getting really into a lot of the, the Paleolithic Hebrew and the, and the visual picture language and pulling together scriptures as, as this Bedouin story. It was like really getting into all the biblical pictographic story, the, the tale of what righteousness is and what Debar and what the word of God. And it's a journey through the wilderness to the various watering holes and the green areas. And so what righteousness really looks like. And they were just really, this makes so much sense. So a lot of the stories I was bringing through the Bible was being told in these picture stories that's in the original Hebrew that Moses spoke of. Well, anyway, they were totally fascinated. And so real Christianity was making perfect, simple, childlike sense. And we we're getting into it where well, they were very profoundly touched by all of this. And they're like, you know, wow, you know, this, 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 this is it. This is, you know, this is the, what we needed to hear. This is from God, this whole thing. Well, they had told me that after that conversation, they had, had already set up a Skype meeting with some guests that were here a couple weeks ago who are really into martial arts and into Qigong and all the different like uh, Eastern philosophies and stuff. And they said, hey, we really were pushing for this whole Skype meeting to have with them. And they wanted to be our life coaches and all this other kind of stuff. And so... I said it was really weird because that was a couple of weeks before that uh, talk we had that they set up the meeting and it was for the day after our talk. And it was real powerful when we talked because we were sitting in this very place and the Holy Spirit was really here. It was powerful. And they felt like, we feel like we've like known you forever now, you know. It's a real brother and sister in Christ moment, you know. And um, so I said, but then we had this Skype meeting that we had set up. So they're there and they're telling us all this stuff about like how to attract, you know, more, you know, like, you know, it's this whole universe thing and, you know, and, and you creating these positive energy and vibrations around you in such a way that you draw and you attract these things and you visualize and all this stuff. And I'm getting into it. like, yeah, that's the laws of attraction, you know, and, uh, and it's, you know, telling you this big quote secret. This is this whole kind of mind science thing. But it's modern witchcraft. And I'll tell you why. And I started really breaking it down and where this stuff comes from. And kind of, you know, the whole like uh, Esther Hicks. And, you know, I started really getting into the history of it and saying, I will, I said, they're probably telling you all this stuff at a small fee of what? And they said, well, $1,500. I said, well, there you go. I said, so let me ask you, how many, uh, how many people staying here that you charge per night would you have to have to make up for that $1,500? In other words, how far back do you got to go to make up for something I can tell you on one night, everything that they're ever going to teach you, and then in the end to conclude that that is witchcraft? 
that is about the powers of the universe and nature and the stars and everything else and pulling them together for your own purposes, your own means. And in the end, to find out that that is not the spirit of God. That secretly, even though it's hid behind all these benevolent kind of a, a rationale, that behind it is greed and selfishness. And that's what you're going to be left with in the end. Maybe you'll get some stuff, but that stuff isn't some benign power. These are demonic forces that are doing that. And But you've lost Christ in the end because Christ, what I found out, is the ultimate treasure. You don't get things from Christ, and that's what Christianity has turned into. The, the end game of a Christian is to get Christ, the only begotten, the basar, the one who has everything, that never diminishes, that never goes away. And the ultimate consummation of that is when he gives us the, the body that, and brings us into his kingdom to enjoy all of that face to face with him and in him and in that eternal reality. Christ is the treasure. Just like the name of your son, Zephaniah. The word Zephaniah means a hidden treasure revealed. And Christ is the Zephaniah. He's the hidden treasure revealed. It's not that he has treasures for us. He is that treasure. And that's the big thing. He's the only begotten. He's the bizarre. He is that treasure. You know, and so, you know, I was telling them about like, you know, back when I was 19 and, <clears throat> you know, my dad, who's married to one of the Shrivers and all these super mega wealthy people are sitting around the dinner table and the one guy who helped to fund Burger King to these people from England and he had a $30,000 a month coke habit and he saw how miserable he is and all of that. Well, they finally say, okay, it's time to eat dinner. We all sit at this table and all these people from these very kind of aristocratic backgrounds and you know, all this money, you know, all this Shriver slash Kennedy slash, you know, whatever, you know, this elitist kind of group. And we all sit down at the table and this guy who I was talking to says, hey, David, what's your philosophy of life? And all these people went quiet. And I said, well, I do have a philosophy of life. I... Pretend that I went through this life, experience that you can experience, get all the things and do all the things that a person can do. And in the end, and the day that I'm going to die, I say, God, please let me go back to being 19 years old and start all over again. And then, bam, here I am. I'm 19. I got my wish. And they all went, whoa, because they couldn't go back. These were all people that had wealth and power and influence and had all the things that that a person thinks that's what I need in life. And then they, I had the one thing they didn't have, that realization at 19, what they would give to go back and do it all over again. And I said, and what I have come to find out is that Christ is my treasure. He's not what I get things from. One Christ called me to himself and he stood there with his arms open and said, David, <clears throat> come unto me. You who labor heavy laden, I shall give you my rest. I am life. You're crossing from death into life. You're crossing from darkness to light. Come to me. I am your life. And that to me was like the realization that, that Christ is the goal. He's the treasure. I said, and, and in the end, that's what you're going to find out. And in the end, if you stood there and you realized that you forsook him only to pursue these other things, how empty that will be on that day. And that's all that has to offer you, that witchcraft. In the end, you're sitting around with your ruined things that will be destroyed when he arrives. And th at that time, the only thing you're going to wish is that he was your treasure, that it was him in whom you have found your pleasure and your treasure in. And that's all I care to do is to, is to go around bringing people this treasure that is free, even though it may cost you everything that you cherish, but it's, it's free to you. You know, he's that treasure and he's the one that really, in the end, really pays out. They're just like, whoa, you know, like we are so glad we met you because we would probably have gone down that path to have these people as our life coach and everything else. And I said, as Christians, to be seduced 
by glitzy, well-crafted, modern witchcraft. I said, what, what a tragic end. He says, what I have to give you is for free. I will never charge you anything. I'm always suspicious of preachers that are sitting there saying, hey, listen, you've got a tithe while I go ahead and purchase myself a golden Mercedes Benz or something like that. I said, what I will give you will be absolutely free. This is the riches of heaven. And because I decided to pursue the riches of heaven, I've been getting the riches of heaven. These are these amazing sights and views of who Christ is and, and what his mind is and what his purpose is. And that's what I have to give. And they said, wow, well, you know, and they were actually saying to me, well, we were talking about that saying, this is, we've never heard anything like this and we don't want to puff up your head. And I said, trust me, God breaks the vessels that he uses. He weakens the vessel. And trust me, I get weakened. You're not going to bear um, his glory in, in these truths without God making sure that you know just how mortal you are, just how vulnerable you are, just how fallible you are. And he really thins out those lines. So pride and understanding God's glory won't go together. He won't allow it, to be honest with you. So you have to be willing to embrace that. You have to really to see his glory. But these are the treasures of heaven.